Okay, this is where, this is the real part of the talk. And that is showing how to factor recursion out of data types with uh, fix, and then how to, op how to do recursion on the fixed data types. And the benefit of this is it allows you to reason about the recursion and the base case is completely separately. You don't have to think of recursion. Uh, and it's applicable any type that has a recursive structure, which are lists and trees. So the first example is this thing that I'm calling natural. So a natural number is either zero or a successor of a natural number. So basically it's numbers that are is greater than or equal to zero. And this is the repeat of that same definition, data natural. So the way you factor the recursion out of the base structure is you define another data type, which is generally referred to as a pattern functor. And it says where, you, where the recursion was, like zero had no recursion. The suck does because it refers back to natural. So zero, you just have a zero element. And by uh, convention, people put F on the end, which means functor. Uh, and then you have the suck F, and you have the R in the recursive position. And then you have to derive functor. It's absolutely necessary for it to be a functor for this to work. And then you def de de define a type saying nat and say it's a fixed of nat F. And what you work with is this. So your program is thinking in terms of nats. But it, what's really going on is you've got a fix of nat f, nat f being this definition. This is gone now completely. This is just how you would have done it ex with explicit recursion. Now we're doing it with taking the uh, recursion out and using fix to put the recursion back in, which will show fix. So what fix is, and uh, uh, I, I'm not going to try, and I would, and I, I wouldn't incur, I would not encourage you to try to figure this out because you'll get a headache, uh, how this actually works. Uh, I've learned how to do these things by actually on paper or pencil or whatever, sitting down and just trying things out and showing it things, how they get wrapped and unwrapped. But the main point is, is why it exists and not, not how it works, but why it exists. So what it says is fix of F is this definition. And like I said, don't worry about it. What it basically says is, given an F, it just wraps that up and fix. And you can think of unfix as this. Given a fix of F, given a fix of F, give back the F. In other words, fix wraps it up and fix. Unfix gives you back the thing unwrapped. That's it. So fix is going to be used by a lot of library tunes to add one level of recursion and unfix removes one level of recursion. And you can see the recursion here because you've got the F fix F, so it refers to itself. So there's recursion in here. Uh, that's the part they say that to get, you'll get a headache trying to, to deal with it. But that's where the recursion is and this is the stuff that deals with each level at a time. So the idea of fix is its generic recursive structure and you can use it to write a recursive type without using recursion and uh, then you add fix like we saw on the previous page to add it. So here's the generic recursive type without recursion. It's got R at the recursion points and then this you fix it to add the recurs recursion to it. So now that you've done that how are you going to operate on net? So I'm going to skip this section because I'm realizing that it doesn't really help. So if you're familiar with uh, fixed point combinators, what fix is is a type level fixed point combinator. So like the, the Y combinator is a value level fixed point combinator that you use to make a function recursive by passing it to itself as one of its arguments. And this just does that for data types. 
So this, it, it, it seems like this takes the recursion out of, off the right-hand side and moves to the left-hand side, in a sense. Hmm. I don't think of it as left or right, but it, it, it uh, wouldn't not, so I'm not sure what you mean by right and left. Um, whether or not it's a, it moves, so, bef so before you did um, success, success, success of zero. Well, it is success of some natural. It's the right. successor of some natural. Now it's the successor of some functor. Okay. And if it happens to be that you pass in the same functor as the, the functor, then it's equivalent to the successor of a natural. Does that make sense? And you can you can use this to uh, you know have different functors. The the idea is that where you put this R, that's the part where then the fixed definition and everything that use it are going to use when they're doing recursive calls. You don't have to think about it anymore because the the whole fixed point machinery is going to deal with that for you. So if you go back one slide, after. Ignoring the top lines, so you're saying this replaces the top line. Right, this mm -hmm. one here. Then after net f and net are defined, then net is a flat, net f is a flat structure and net is recursive net f's. Yeah, well it's... Well, net f's not going to be flat because it refers to some functor. So, uh, but you don't know which one it is, it is yet. Okay. It's not referring to itself, it's referring to some functor that is parameterized by. Huh. Okay. So, uh, in, a, in, in one meeting, I doubt you'd, I wouldn't get it. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, my main hope of, of this presentation is it'll motivate you to say, this stuff looks kind of useful, I'm gonna go find out and use it. Yeah, it, uh, it might be easier to figure out, and there's probably more material for you know learning how fixed point combinators work on functions and to make recursive functions. And if you get that and how you refactor a recursive function into a function that takes a parameter that it uses for the recursive call, then you just apply that same thinking to the data type constructor level, and that's what you've got. Okay. When you're using this too, you'll tend to write smart constructors. So for defining, to, to work with zero, you, you can have this thing that says zero and what you give it any value and it's going to, uh, well, this has no, it has no uh, argument, excuse me. And it'll return fix of zero F. And uh, the suck function will give you a nat and give you back another nat, which is whatever nat, this is, done in point freestyle, so whatever argument you give it, it's first going to call suck f on it and then wrap that up in a fix. So basically, if you say, you know, suck of zero and then suck of that, suck of that, you'll get returned something that looks like that. But most of the time, you don't even have to think at that level. Let's actually see this in operation. This is where it starts to, for me, becoming a, a little bit clearer. And that is, we have a list, f, this is the pattern functor. It says a list of type A, and R is the functor part, that this is where the recursion is. So I've either got a cons, which is the C, of this A element onto R. We don't even know what R is at this point. Or we have N, which means nil. And it's deriving functor, which is the critical part. The, like I said, these two are just so I can show things in the program. Then I wrap that up by saying a list of A is fix list F of A. Then I give it some smart constructors. So nil is just as a fix of the N, which is the nil, representing nil. And cons is just given an X and some X's, just uses the C of X and X's and does the right thing. And this is where it's hard to think about because you see this R here, so you think, well, okay, that's the R part. But these X's, aren't these elements? Well, by the time you call that, it's a list of A. That's what's here. 
and a list of A is a fix of the list of A. So it actually, that's where this whole, you know it's a certain fixed point functor of the, of the list fixed point functor F. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's magic. <laughs> that's the, and I encourage you to think of it as magic right now. Uh, and in, in your spare time, when you can't sleep at night, do equational reasoning on one of these to see it in operation. And so, and I'm not gonna go this fixed point thing. I realize that that's not helping. Okay, another example, and this just shows you about the recursive part, and that is I have a tree of type A, and the R is just the recursion. Uh, so I either have an empty, I have a leaf with a value A, or I have a node which has two recursive points. It derives functor, and then I say type tree of A of fix tree of A. So I think you see the pattern now, because we've done that a number of times. Would a derived functor look very similar to the functor for maybe? Yes. Okay. I'll show some of the derived functors a little bit okay. later. Uh, matter of fact, very soon. So here's, here's where, now we're gonna actually start using these things by using recursion functions from a library. And the thing I'm gonna, three that I'm gonna talk about now are kata, ana, and hilo. Kata being catamorphism, which is just a fancy name for fold. Uh, and anamorphism is just a fancy name for unfolding. In other words, given some value, unfold it into something else. And then hylomorphism just it says first do an anamorphism, and after you're done with that, then do a catamorphism. That's all it is. Uh, and there's a lot of other ones. That's why there's dot, dot, dot there. But we're not going to go into those tonight. But I'm going to mention them. So catamorphism. Uh, kata is actually a uh, Greek word that means downwards. Why down? Yeah, Anna means up. I guess somebody thought if you're folding something, that's going down, and if you're unfolding it, that's going up. But um, well, it's a consuming, and then Anna is building. Right. So building folding, up. Folding, folding consumes, in, and you get a, a single element in the end. It's, uh, but, but I don't think of that as down. <laughs> it, Consuming is tearing down. Oh, okay. And, down oh, and in, 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 uh, in building, is, I mean, uh, producing is building right. up. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, tearing down or building up. Okay, that's good. I couldn't, I never hooked into those. So the idea here is once we're going to write fold R once for all data types. So here it is, and this is the main part of the talk, and that CATA says, for some functor f, if I have a given a function uh, that contains a, 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 that functor of a, it'll return the a, and given a fix of that functor, then it will return the, the final a. And what it, how the definition for it is this, and that is first you unfix it, which is unrolling one level of recursion, then you F map cata alg, and alg, alg just means is the algebra you're going to use, which you'll see what that means in a moment. And then, after you've done that, then you're going to run the algebra. So what that does is this does one level of recursion. This is going to handle the recursive call, and this is going to handle for each level the actual value. Okay, what is, and ignore this part about out F. That was for a part that I decided is not helping. So th this is where you can really see it in going, this nat to int. So remember the nat is just that representation of, of zero or suck a zero or suck suck zero, on and on and on. Let's turn that into a regular integers that we know and love, zero, one, two, three. So what this says, you could have done this with explicit recursion just by walking down that, you know, list of sucks and just counting them. Just like we counted the number of elements in a list, you don't count care, you just count how many things there are until you get to the zero, which is nil. Uh, so it's the same idea. You could have done that, or you could have done a fold, but the kata does that for you. 
So what this says is CATA ALG, and the ALG just means algebra. Uh, and, and when you see talks about this, they generally talk about algebra. And all algebra means is you've got some values and some ways to, uh, and some laws about operating on that. So the algebra says if I'm given a zero F, it's just zero. If I'm given a suck F and an N, I'm just going to add one to N. And that seems pretty weird because you say, well, what the heck is N? Uh, you need recursion to find out what N is. Well, that's the magic of this whole thing. And I'm actually gonna deep dive on that in a moment is it shows, uh, it does the recursion for you here automatically, uh, so to speak. So the main point is, you can start, if you use this stuff, defining the, uh, the recursive data types is pretty straightforward. You just put that R where the recursion points are and then wrap the whole thing up in a fixed point. A fix, excuse me, not a fixed point, a fix. Uh, so whenever you're defining functions that operate on it, you don't have to deal with the recursion. They're handled separately. So that's where the recursion's been factored out. So if I say nat to int of this, I do indeed get a three. So it operates correctly. So detail. Uh, this NIA, that is this right here, nat to int. So I've just separated that out. Uh, and then this is the, uh, the functor for NatF, the derived one. So it looks just like maybe, you know, if it's zero, it's zero. If it uh, contains this, then it does the F on that and wraps that back up in, uh, so it looks just like maybe. Uh, so let's actually try this out. Can you, can you, everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I give nat to int this suck suck zero, first I expand the suck suck zero and it gives me back this thing. Next, I replace nat to int with its definition, which is the kata of the algebra, and the algebra was that NIA thing, right? This is the algebra. Nat, NIA means nat int algebra. <laughs> NIA. Uh, and the reason it's so small is because it's like I actually give everything on one line. So kata NIA is this. So then when I expand the definition of kata NIA, which is, excuse me, this, the definition of kata, it looks like this. So the only thing that's changed, so look here, this changes to there. That's what happens on that line. And then for this line, this changes to there. So that to in, gets replaced by its definition. And then kata gets replaced by its definition and goes to this. So this is a literally equational reasoning. Uh, so there it is. So now the next step is, this is a function and this is data. This is a function on the left, data on the right. So it says out f, which I didn't show you, but it's like, un, it's unfix. Just remember, it's unfixed. So it unwraps one level recursion. So what it does is it drops off this fix. So we go to this next line and we see the out f is now gone and that level of fix is gone. So we're here. Now we need to do the uh, f map of catania. And f map takes this uh, yeah, that and this suck function. And all, if you look at fmap, look what it says. If you've got fmap of f, and here is uh, the f, catania, and you've got this, the suck of it, it's just going to move the f into here and the suck to the outside. So watch this, the magic. See this suck here? It goes to there. <laughs> and the catania, which is the, the function, goes to here on the value that's left behind. That makes sense? It's magic. That's, that's what I really like about functional programming. It's just tons of magic. Uh, okay, so then what happens next? So we, we got to here. Now we're evaluating the... Oh, uh, yeah. 
Okay, yep, Nia is next. So Nia says, when I have this, it's just one plus n. So here's the one plus, I should have written this just one plus n. It wouldn't make any difference because the n's the recursive part. Uh, but here's the one plus. So I've replaced Nia in the suck with one plus, and I come back with one plus catania fix. And guess what? At this point, we're exactly the same place that we were right here, but we're now one number less. So I could walk through this, but it, when I walk through this, it would be exactly what we just did. And then it does it again. So it keeps going down until you finally end up with a Nia of zero, which just says it's a zero. So you get zero and you end up with one plus one plus zero. And one thing I said about this, this literally is executable code. Because I say this value equals, this is like a little test function I have, and it says everything in this array should have the exact same value, and that value should be two. So I just, and a lot of times when I want to see how this works, I'll do some of it in pencil and paper, but sometimes I'll actually set a breakpoint, like on nat to int, and step through the code, which is not very pretty, but you at least kind of get an idea of what's happening, and, and you can actually see the data types in that. So I find that to be really useful. So that is Kata. And here's another couple of, uh, of functions. So filter, if you say you want to write a filter on this list that we defined using a fix, you say use Kata to find an algebra for it. That's it. The algebra is when you hit nil, it's nil. When you have an x, if the predicate's true, then you cons that x on the result. Otherwise, it's just the tail. And it's weird because there's no recursion in here, and the recursion is really happening here at these x's, but it's the whole machinery that we're just looking at, the fix and, and stuff, moving that around. And you want, this is, look, notice again, this is the list, what's derived for list, the functor. And it says for nil, it's just nil, which is like nothing. Or for uh, the uh, cons case, it just moves the f towards the recursion. So you can see the recursion happening there. So that's all happened by the, uh, uh, the functor image, uh, the functor for that fix. And it shows once again that the filter actually works. Okay. Next is anamorphisms. So you need a, a mnemonic device to help you remember which one is which. You just remember that uh, bodybuilders sometimes <laughs> abuse anabolic steroids <laughs> to build up their muscles. <laughs> it's the same root. That's better right. to remember than just remember anamorphisms. <laughs> <laughs> But that's much more colorful. <laughs> so this one, not only is anamorphins cool, but it allows you to talk with some really cool words because you can say co-recursion and, uh, and, and co-recursive production. And uh, recursion in category theory generally means uh, recursion that ha that's finite and that you are recursing down to some value. It has a, it has a you, you, it's, it's like in a theorem prover where you have to, every time you make a step in your recursion, you're actually reducing the world. So you know you're making progress towards a uh, determination. Whereas co-recursion means you're actually building something up and it might not ever terminate. But it always produces something. Yeah, that's the only thing you know is that it'll always produce something. So it's not going to it's not going to hang. So something will happen, but you but you it doesn't say anything about its ending. So here is uh, to talk about anaphorism. Let's first talk about it for list. So there is a function in Prelude. Is it no? It's actually in 
data.list, I think it's in data.list, called unfold R. And it's defined this way. And it is the dual of cataborgisms. And let's see how that works. There's this thing called view patterns in Haskell. And what it allows you is to say this. Well, let's look at fold first. This is a fold, but it's written in a way that is closer to category theory, which we won't drop into why. But it just says, given an F, which takes a maybe of a pair and returns a B, and given a list, return a B. So it's just like the folds we've been looking at, except for now the function is supposed to take a maybe. So uh, if, if it's an empty list, then you give F nothing. And if it's a non-empty list, then you give F adjust with the element as the left and then the recursive fold, which really is just like we, we saw earlier, and that was you said F with X as the first element and the recursive call. But it uses this just a nothing part, which has to do with initial algebras and everything, but we won't go there. But unfold, if you look at this, it's absolutely identical. Notice this, the function was a maybe of a pair to a B. Now it's a B to a maybe A and B. And then you give it a B, this one was the result was a B, and this one you gave it an A, and there was a list of A, and this one you get a list back. So everything's just switched around. And using view patterns, you can even see this, that unfold, given an F, given a B, that when you call the F, returns nothing, then it should return nil. Otherwise, if you give B to the F and it returns a just of the X and unfold of the rest, then you can say X and X's. So what view patterns do is just say you can, in the argument position, you can express the function, the return value of the function, and view it that way, even though it's not really being executed at that point. It's, it's, it's basically some shorthand for doing case statements. But they all, the point there was is it, it's a dual, and duals just mean generally you just turn all the arrows around and everything's... Uh, works in, in reverse, so to speak. Uh, okay, so here's some examples of the, remember, we're still just working with the list unfold now. We haven't actually got to the, the uh, generic one. So replicate says, given an int in an element A, give back a list of A's that are as long as whatever that int is. So if you give that unfold that we were just looking at a C, that says when it's zero, return nothing. When it's n, return just and give it that x and n minus one. And you'd have to go back to look at this definition to convince yourself uh, what that did. I should have put that on the same page. Just switching back and forth, not going to make it. So I guess we'll just have to imagine it works. <laughs> so if you say replicate four, it works. So you definitely get four uh, asterisks. Uh, but this looks just like what we've been looking at, because unfold now is taking some co-algebra. That's why that's a C. Uh, we were called the last one an algebra. This one's called a co-algebra because it's producing things, not tearing them down. And, uh, and then same thing. Here's one called lines by, which given uh, some T and returns a Boolean, given a, a list of T will turn a list of list of Ts. So basically saying that uh, if it's an empty list, nothing. Otherwise, you uh, dr break on the predicate, drop one second. Why, is it, why does it say drop one second? Lines by. I knew what this, I forgot, I just realized I didn't know this. Yeah. Oh, I know why. Because this, this is, yeah, okay, yeah. It's saying when it's equal to this guy, then separate it. So it's dropping the, con, the what, it's dropping the separator. Mm -hmm. So you break, you break on the uh, P, which is the P is it equal to a comma. And once it is, you uh, drop on it. And then it's returning that. So where's, once... It, where's second to find? Uh, oh, that's a good point. Why is it? I don't know. 
Let's find out. Control dot arrow. I'm not sure if that's the well. It has to be because oh, yeah. So it's the second element in a pair, right? It, what if you so if you give it A, B, and C, it's going to return. Let me go to one other thing real quick. Definitely from code director. Oh, okay. That was a very good question. And uh, I don't even know for sure how to read that signature. Because this almost looked like that must be a, it seems like that'd be a functor. Of some, or yeah, a got, because yeah, it's because the D, uh, D comes from the context of A, I guess. It's A. It's a okay, yeah, let's let's. So you, you have A arrow. <laughs> We're gonna have to find this out. Is this you're, you're probably using it in the context of What was the, the function arrow? What was the name of it? Control dot arrow dot arrow. List. Huh. A mirror image of first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Oh, okay. So the arrow is a function. Yeah. And so A is a function. So it's B is the B result. Is, it's, it's the function. So A is function. B is the source type. C is the destination. Right. The result type. So it's it, A, B, C is really B, oh. arrow, C. Where arrow is, you know, the function arrow. Oh, okay. So right. it keeps D the way it is and just applies the function to B and gets C. That's what it looks like. Second. You get B and you get D in both of these. Yeah, but you give D to it, so it just probably keeps it. Where do you give D to it? Um, the first, oh. the, the D comma B is the first argument to the function. No, but this is the result. This, it, it says... You should, you should retype, uh, copy that line, so and it, then retype it in your terminal, but replace A with arrow, and I think it'll make sense. Yeah. Actually, I already had it. Oh, because it's, it returns a, a, a new function that keeps... So you're saying to do... Wrap, wrap the left side in parentheses. So the left side. Yeah. And then replace A with control dot arrow dot arrow. No. no. Go back. With, so the the dash right angle in parentheses for A. Wait, go back. Uh -huh. So between B and C on the left side. Oh. Put in put the. You mean this kind of yeah. arrow? And then remove the A. Remove yeah. this A. No, no. no. Oh, oops. The A on the first arm. Remove the beginning A. Yeah. When you say beginning A. That one. That one. And oh. now do the oh. same thing for the second A. So wrap the right side in parentheses and delete that A and put the B, C. arrow between. Uh, no, no, no. no. Uh, just remove that and put the, the function arrow between the two oh. pairs. Because it's an infix. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like 
<laughs> promotes a function oh, to that's to B to pairs. So you get a function from B to C, and then you get a tuple of DB, and you get back a tuple of DC. Yeah. So it takes that function, B to, B to C, applies it to your second arc inside the thing you give it, and keep D the way it is. But why did you give it D? You give, you give, so D comes from the pair you feed it. Because it, it, right. it, 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 it was on the function. Right, oh. right. Yeah, so second creates a function that pulls Let's out the second thing. So does that make sense in here then? If you say to break, so which just says... Type of break. Let's look at... Yeah. That's what we'd expect. Yep. So it just splits the list on whatever the... When the predicate's true, it splits that list into two parts. It drops the very first thing in the oh it says yeah, sec it oh there it is one. and the, on the second guy yeah yeah okay that makes sense because you got back two pieces and it wants to drop the comma off the right hand one so it doesn't touch the a like you pointed out and then it drops one off of the second one so the magic of second is that we want to keep you, you the keep first thing there the and you apply the function that you pass the second to the the second element. See, see, and there's the pair for from break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, cool. So it takes the function b to c and the pair, and then it applies the b to c function on the right hand side of the pair. Huh. The second element. That's yeah, cool. the control arrow stuff comes up a lot in point free yeah. uh, code because you often want to, you know. Curry and uncurry things, and then apply things to you know one or the other argument. Or if you saw that talk that I gave on kind of uh, the the intro to category theory, Lambda Lounge, about a year ago or so, and it, that had a lot of arrow examples in it, which it was kind of funny because at the time I was studying that stuff, I didn't know control at arrow. And I kept running it, and then I ran the stuff. Then later, I was reading some other code and saw Arrow, and I said, wait a minute, that's that other stuff I'm using. <laughs> but I would, the other guy that I've been reading his stuff, he didn't even mention it, because he was kind of deriving it all from first principles. Mm -hmm. So it was like, oh, I actually start to get why the Arrow would be useful. It, basically, it becomes real useful when you've got two or more things at a time, but you only want to operate on one side or the other. Or you, you're gonna, you, you know you're going to get one of two things, but you don't know which, but it's going to be tagged. That was the either stuff we were showing before. Okay, continuing. Uh, let's actually skip this. This is just more of the same, but you know, what this allows you to do is you define your algebra and then you just do the case analysis on the data and you say exactly what you want to do, but you don't have to deal with recursion because that's handled it elsewhere. So it really lets you just concentrate on the uh, decisions you need to make based on each particular data. And that's, the, that's what I get out of that. So the whole idea of anamorphism, it's co-recursion, which is the dual recursion. So co-recursion produces potentially infinite co-data. And recursion consumes necessarily finite data. So here it is. Here is the ANA. Uh, so there's no distinction between co-data and data in Haskell, so we're using this fix here to mean the same thing, uh, to get the recursion. So an anamorphism looks very similar. If you, if you look at, the, here's the catamorphism on the bottom. So it first applies the co-algebra, whereas in the catamorphism, you first did the unfixed. In other words, you were built, tearing it down. The co-algebra builds it up first, and then you do exactly the same thing. You f-map the ana over the co-algebra, which is like here. And then when you're done, you add the level of recursion to it. So it is absolutely the same thing in reverse. And if you look at this, here is it in action. We, before, remember, we were looking at nat to int. Now we have int to nat. 
it's because we're building something up, and that is that suck, 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 suck data structure. So we're saying, the, for an animate, the coalgebra is when n is zero or less, just give it back a zero. Otherwise, give back the successor of n minus one. And once again, that magic of the uh, Anna is handling this n here, the recursion that's really represented by n. So COAG is just means coalgebra. Once again, recursion is not part of the semantics. And if you want to look at it in operation, you say internet to three, and it does give you back the correct thing. Here's another little trick uh, which was interesting, and that was if you really start using this stuff the next page, it's probably a good idea because I think one reason we all like Haskell is because of uh, the type system. It's, and well, you don't want to actually be giving co-data where you're expecting data. Uh, and so you can have this thing called cofix instead, which if you look at it, it's completely isomorphic and structurally identical to fix. The only difference is it's a different type. It's cofix. But where there was a fix, now there's a cofix. Where there was an unfix, there's now an uncofix. And all that does is allow you to data have the type signature of Anna Prime say that it's cofix here rather than if you look at the other one, it was fix because we were reusing it. That way you can't mix those accidentally. So let's see uh, that in action. So a stream is just like a list, but it has no base case. Uh, there's because there's no nil the stream goes on forever. So what this says is the pattern function stream f of type a is that a and then the recursion is the r. And then you say type stream of a is you wrap that up with a cofix. And the derived functor looks like this which has no base case but it just moves uh, applies the f to the uh, recursive point. So once again, you build some uh, constructors and deconstructors. So cons of x onto x's just says do an s of x on those x's and wrap it in a cofix. And head means you have to uncofix. And notice there's, this is a pattern, a view pattern, because it's on the left hand side. It says if you if you the, run the uncofix function and it returns f s at x and don't care, then give, just give back the x. And tail, same thing, but you're giving back the x's. And here is it, uh, the using that stream. You can say iterate s, which given some function, uh, call Anna and give it a coalgebra. So C of X is just cons that X on to that function applied to X. So let's try it out. Here's a stream and an infinite integers of, 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 of infinite stream of integers, which are increasing by one. And if we have a define a take on that stream, and then we say take six, we see one, two, three, four, five, six. And it goes on all that trouble for just an infinite list. <laughs> and this stream is different than when we're talking about streams like in the pipes and conduit sense, that those are completely different kinds of streams. Well, I, I, well yes and no. They're basically following this same structure, actually. I think they're built up in terms of uh, functor. I'm not sure if, it, if they've got explicit fixed points, but they're, they're functor-based things, kind of like no, okay. these are. And um, when you look at the, when you look at how they go to the next thing, it's it's not super different from how this works. I have to look at that. I I wasn't realizing. That. Cool. So I have a question. I I see the case of the infinite list. So say you have some seed number, and you can generate an infinite number of random numbers, you know, these the next one in there. But I don't see the case where, like, especially in the replicate one, where you're passing in 
before, or you're passing in the exit case, or in this case, the take six. I could always do that with a for loop, couldn't I? I mean, just. Oh, yeah. So, so I don't see the benefit of doing this when you have like a replicate for. I think for the trouble with presentations is you tend to, I tend to come up with real simple examples that are easy to understand as an example so with the, so you can focus on the mechanism we're talking about rather than the example but where you use these in a uh, in, in a larger structure is probably where it become interesting I guess also you don't have four loops in uh, like well, yeah I, I guess I guess it's because of one of the benefits would be consistency. Like a for loop is a subset of this. Like I, I could do infinite list or just a defined number of things. But with a for loop, you have, it's, it's well I, I, again a for loop is uh, it's um, it requires mutation. You can't do a for loop at least in the sense of the traditional for loops rather than like a for each. But if you think about what a for each loop is, you've got to you know build the thing that you're going to for each over, and you know you can't build the thing that you're going to for each over without something like this. So I've done some the first part of this where you take a recursive function and flattening it out in JavaScript. If I have a recursive function it's really, really slow because it has to use all this memory. I assume the same benefit would come here, where you can actually pre-calculate all the code and then just run it line by line, and it speeds things up. It's, but, but, uh, well, the, the runtime mm -hmm. for Haskell and the way it, the execution model is very different from the JavaScript. Right, but I assume that the reason you would do this instead of recursion just a normal recursion, is you get that benefit of not using as much memory. Actually, your question leads really good into the next section because there's okay. there's a okay. there's a thing that happens in the next recursion thing where it's actually f doing fusion, which means it's actually conceptually building two different data structures. Like in, in JavaScript, if you wanted to first build a tree and then you then you wanted to go across that tree and, and iterate and then uh, break it down into a single value. Uh, you have to build up the tree first, and then you'd have to walk the tree later. And what I'm about to show you, it's actually, you, it, it will only build a little piece of the tree, and then it'll immediately use it. So it'll conceptually build the tree, but it'll never build the whole thing in memory at once. Yeah. And one of the big benefits of this, so it, when you talk about for loops, a for loop, you have to approach each for loop as its own thing, and you have to analyze it, all of the pieces of code within the for loop to understand what that particular for loop is doing. There, it's not, there's no abstraction there. It's just, okay, I know there's a loop, let me see every step happening in here and think about them together, and you have to approach every for loop as something that could potentially do anything. This allows you to abstract different ways of doing things and reason about them as abstract entities. It gives you building blocks to compose programs rather than having to start from the very basics of your control flow each time. Oh, I get it. I, yeah. This step, this function, this <coughs> abstraction reminds me kind of like the internet. Nobody knows what, you can't draw the internet. No one knows what it looks like, but I, I know I can talk to this guy and this guy, that's it. I'm just, you know. So you're at one node and you can only go one step. <laughs> yeah. And you never know like what the whole big thing is, but it doesn't matter. It'll still work as long as you know what to do right now for mm -hmm. this one path. Yeah, actually it's a good analogy because in a certain sense you're making it so you're always operating on small local decisions. Right. But the combination of all the local decisions is what makes it so powerful. Yeah, yeah. And this allows you to uh, see the have higher level control flow composition. And also it allows you to apply equational reasoning to your control flow. 
and to uh, optimize things through equational processes so that you know that your optimized version is equivalent to the one you started out with. And a, a lot of the research that was done on this was that uh, the, the whole point of it was to be able to reason about programs specifically in the context of optimizing them. Hmm. So you know that you have a really concise, simple program in terms of these high-level <coughs> operations that says, you know, what, what your program does. It's basically a specification. And then from that specification, you can recognize what parts are going to be uh, inefficient and use algebraic reasoning to optimize those into a more uh, efficient form. And you know because of your reasoning that the, two, the optimized form and the equivalent uh, original statement specification are the same. So let's move on because we're uh, over an hour. And this is the very last one. Although I'm going to mention a couple more, but I won't actually go into it. Uh, this one, hylomorphism, is just basically an anamorphism followed by a catamorphism. In other words, a unfold followed by a fold. But what's really cool is I got to call up my nephew on the phone and say, man, I, I'm just learn how to do a co-recursive co-data production followed by a recursive data consumption using a hylomorphism, which is just an anamorphism followed by a, a, a catamorphism. And he hung up on me. This is why we started operators. Right. <laughs> When you finally learn what, when you have the magic decodering, it's just like, oh, why do you just say that in the first place? Where do all these fancy names come from? I think 911 isn't allowed to hang up on me. So they'll just keep listening. Oh, well, okay. That's where I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> they'll send the, 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 the people the straight jacket. <laughs> So let's take a look. So you can, and you look at the definition, it's exactly what it says. Given a function from an A to a functor of A, and given a function from a functor of B to a B, first, uh, and then given an A, first you give A to uh, Anna of H, which turns it into this, and then a cat of G. And you know what? No, that's right, yeah, cat of G. I think. Uh, so here's the fusion part, which I'm not going to draw. You know, this gives you all the details, but the main point is, is you don't have to build intermediate data structures because if you look at what's going on here, which I'm not going to drop into, it just allows you. And the next page is going to show you that even though conceptually they, they're getting built, you don't have to build the full data structure first when you're doing the Anna followed by the Cata. And a lot of that's because Haskell is lazy too, which helps. And there's a little side note. You can actually define Cata and Anna in terms of Hilo, uh, which, you know, when you start looking at all this function, uh, functional programming stuff, you, you just, it, there's just a million different ways to get through the same, you know, the little networks of things that are going on. But here's a merge sort. And what it's doing is it's first building a balanced binary tree of the day of a list, and then it's folding it with a catamorphism. So it's building the binary tree with an anamorphism, and it's folding it with a catamorphism. And the folding it, it's folding it into a sorted list. So how does this work? You just say merge sort is a hilo, and you give it a coalgebra and an algebra. The coalgebra says if the list is uh, a list of one element, then just make a leaf out of it. If it's a list, uh, otherwise, make a, a bi it's a binary tree, so it just has a bin with left and right or leaf elements. Uh, so a left and right, where left and right is defined by splitting uh, in the middle. So you just find the length divided by two, 
and split it in the middle. And this returns you back the left and the right elements. So that, if you were doing this in a language like JavaScript, pretty much any other language in the world that's, that's strict, it would have to build up this entire binary tree first. But instead, it'll say, let's say you, know, you came in here and you got this bin element, so a left and right. The next thing that would happen, when I say next, metaphorically, uh, who knows what would really go on with Haskell, but it would, this uh, algorithm would run, al as I read, algebra would run, which is the, uh, the catamorphism. And it says, if I have a binary tree of x's and y's, then I'm just going to merge them. And this merge is from the data list.order, which just says you're giving two ordered lists, uh, merge them together. And well, we haven't ordered them yet, have we? Well, the, and these x's and y's, they, they're not really lists yet. They're, they're lazy. So it gets to this x and y's before it, when it's going to call merge, and it'll kick back into here again and say, oh, let's keep splitting them up until they're things. And so the idea is you've built this binary tree, one element of it, but it immediately gets used. And then you go back and build another one until it's until it does no longer, uh, it, till you've used up all the data. But at each step, you're using the data and in, in, in merging it till you come up with the result. So there's actually this fusion going on where you don't have to build the entire binary tree data structure in memory. Uh, it gets used during the process of, of running this function. And this is the conceptual tree that gets uh, built but it never actually, only one element at a time ever ends up in memory. And it actually does work. So that's it. So the conclusion is we looked at catamorphisms, anamorphisms, and hylomorphisms, which are just folds, unfolds, and refolds, so to speak. And those three actually can express all recursive computation. Uh, there's other recursion schemes, and they're based on the above, that offer more structure. And some of these are the ones. In recursion, there's cata, para, histo, and zygo. In co-recursion, besides ana, there's apo and futo, I guess. And the general one, hilo, because hilo, you can use hilo to build any of